this morning I want us to read first and foremost from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, from verse 1. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lay from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about going to the temple, asked, Arms and Peter fastening his eyes upon him, with John said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he leaping stood up and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And the Lord bless his word to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the passage of scripture that we just read is a very popular one, and uh, everybody who has spent any length of time at all in church know something about the story, the story of the man by the beautiful gate of the temple. But I'd like for us to um, take a little bit of a close look at the, at the story one more time this morning before we pray. Um, I read the first few verses again. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. In the ninth hour, and a certain man lay a limb from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. And the purpose is to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So the few things to note here is that Peter and John were going into the temple at the hour of prayer which is the ninth hour. Now, the ninth hour is, uh, uh, in modern language, would be what time? That would be 3 p.m., all right? It's 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Now, according to the custom in those days, which is a very thoroughly Jewish thing, there were these uh, hours of prayer. So you hear things like the morning watch, you hear things like uh, the first watch of the night. So the day was basically broken into uh, periods of three hours. And so the ninth hour is uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. That counting begins by 6 a.m. in the morning because the Jews had a dawn to dusk kind of uh, arrangement. So the day begins at uh, 6 a.m. and evening begins and it ends by 6 p.m. So you start counting from 6 a.m. Normally we will start counting from 12 midnight into the morning. They will start counting from 6 a.m. So the first hour of the day would be between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. If you take that count, you realize that this, uh, the ninth hour here is 3 p.m. But that's not my focus. My focus is that 
It was the custom in those days that they had these, uh, these times of prayer. There was, a, there was a cycle of prayer that these people maintained. It was something that was carried over from their days in Judaism. And in the temple, there was the practice ongoing, even at this time, because the temple was still totally Judaistic. And the apostles and disciples of Jesus were still used to convening at the temple in order to worship God, because they understood that uh, what Jesus Christ has brought is supposed to be the fullness of the thing that was revealed in Judaism, so that Judaism is a shadow of Christianity. About 3,000 souls, and then in verse 42, the Bible says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, right? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayer. Now, the first thing that was listed on that item is Apostles' Doctrine. The last thing that was listed there is prayer. And between Apostles' Doctrine and prayer, you have fellowship and breaking of bread. So that uh, doctrine and prayer is the bracketing reality of every apostolic community. That, um, you see, when I, when I talk about the bracketing reality, I'm saying that the, the, the thing that holds the enclave together, the, the practice and progression of an apostolic people uh, is marked by these four things doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And I'm saying to you that it's very significant that you have doctrine and prayer bracketing. So, so that if you wanted to wrap this thing together, you are going to have two things in the middle, and then the wrapping will be doctrine and the prayer on the other end. When the apostles were trying to make a case for the necessity for the office of the deacon in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, the Bible says because of the murmurings that had arisen on account of the uh, distribution. Uh, the Grecian Jews that so some of the Jews that were Hellenistic there was a complaint that their women were being left out in the daily distribution and so uh, um, uh, the apostles eventually gathered the people together and they said unto them that it was important for them to look out from among them seven men of honest report because they said it is not good, it is not meet for us, all right? Therefore, brethren, look here among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who will be appointed by this business, all right? Um, and, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Every apostolic community cannot be truly apostolic in the biblical sense of the word if it does not have the priority of prayer as part of its DNA. The DNA, in the DNA of an apostolic enclave or community, prayer is an important strand. So, when the, uh, the Holy Ghost had come upon the apostles and disciples, the apostles felt that uh, prayer was too sacrosanct, so sacrosanct that they still kept going into the temple every time that there was a time for prayer and there were these hours of prayer. I'd like to uh, bring to your notice that till today the same necessity still exists and it's an obligation that you and I must carry as a people. If we are going to see the weight that God intends to make available in the community of His people, because the church is supposed to be thoroughly apostolic. I know that these days, you know, there's a lot of uh, a cliche that is uh, that surrounds the use of the word apostolic and apostleship and all of that. But uh, the the whole idea is this: that in the DNA of every church. Is supposed to be the imprint of apostolicity. That is to say that the, 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 uh, 
texture of any church is supposed to be imbued with the notion or the, the orientation of a saint people. Apostolos, all right? We're going to have the whole uh, word apostle is a saint one. It, it basically means to be sent, to be a saint one. And if Jesus sends us to survive as a unique people in the cacophony of our world, there has to be distinguishing features. There has to be distinct features that set us apart, not only for the purpose of identification, but actually for the purpose of survival. Because we are supposed to thrive in very hostile settings as the church. And in order for that to happen, there are a fail-safe methodology that Jesus Christ has made available, exemplified by his own life that he lived when he was on the face of the earth. So it's not just that, oh, now that Jesus is coming to heaven, we are the ones who need to carry this burden of prayer. No, Jesus himself, his life was marked from start to finish by a commitment to prayer. Because prayer is that handle by which man is able to uh, establish connection and contact with the native abode of his spirit. So that the place from which his authority, his power, his, uh, 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 his delegated possibilities come from is in another world. And prayer is the means by which he bridges the gap between the natural and the supernatural so that he's able to enter into the atmosphere from which the one that, uh, from where he sources his possibilities and by that I'm basically saying that because God is spirit the way that we uh, interact with God is through the instrumentality of prayer and if we do not interact with God sufficiently our spirit will lack the requisite mobility and robustness in order to be able to carry out the functions that God ordains and designs that we carry out on the face of the earth. I'm basically saying that you need to keep in touch with God in order to continue to represent God. And the way by which you keep in touch with God is through the blessed privilege of prayer. When a people begin to pray, what they do is that they are exposing their spirit more and more to its native environment. There is a place where your spirit calls home. There is a place where your spirit is at home. And that place is in the spirit. You see, I think because the truth is the Bible's teaching me just, your body is sourced from the earth. And so the earth sustains your body because your body was sourced from the earth. And the Lord God and of the, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. When that happened in Acts in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, you notice that there was something that came from the ground, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, right? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So your body is a part that was formed, and that part that was formed was formed from the dust of the ground. But that is not all. The Bible says, and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. In order to have this living soul, there was a contribution of different uh, 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 materials or components. And those components, they came from very different places. The first component in view in this passage of scripture comes from the ground, and that eventually ends up being your body. The next component does not come from the ground. It came from the Lord God himself, doing a most to most, you know, our transmission in the life. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. There was something that came from inside of God into the lifeless structure that God had molded on the ground. And when that happened, the man came alive and became a living soul. Now, my point is not to go into uh, the mechanics of everything that you see there. It's to draw your attention to the fact, therefore, that you do have a physical component and you do have uh, a, 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 an invisible component. Properly speaking, you do have a physical component and you do have an immaterial component. There's a part of you that is material in the natural world and there's a part of you that is immaterial. Part of you was sourced from the earth and a part of you was 
not sourced from this earth. Part of it was sourced naturally, and by sourced naturally, I mean a part of it was sourced from outside, from within nature. Right? When we talk about nature, we are talking about the part of the universe, of our world, of the cosmos that is uh, explorable and that can be contacted and that can be examined uh, by the five physical senses. So everything that your eyes can see, that your skin can feel, that your ears can hear, that your tongue can taste, right? the five senses of man. Everything that is explorable and examinable using the five senses is within nature. But you see, nature is not the only place from which you are sourced. Because every human being is a composite. A composite means that you are an entity that is made up of different components, alright? And in this case, you are not just made up of different components, you are made up of different components sourced from different worlds, okay? A part of you came from the physical world, and another part of you came from the invisible world. That part of you that came from the physical world is your body. And the ground from which your body was sourced is the place by which your body is sustained. So the thing that you use to keep this body alive and sustained, huh? It comes from the ground because that's where your body came from. Wherever you are sourced from, that is where you are sustained by. That's the principle. Your body came from the ground. That is why the ground sustains your body. The amala that you eat, the banana that you eat, all right? Uh, the ground that you eat, everything that you eat, basically, which is by the things by which your body is sustained. They are products of the ground. It is a ground. Because you came from the ground. So the ground sustains the you that came from the ground, which basically is your body. But you did not completely and entirely come from the ground. A part of you also came from within God. You do have the spirit. And that spirit was brought into the coalition by God and from God. That your spirit is not sustained by Amala. Ah, Tuo Shinkafa does not sustain that your spirit because Tuo came from the ground. And because your spirit does not come from the ground, Tuo cannot reach to where your spirit is. Tuo is helpless in ministering to the need of your spirit directly. The only thing that can cater to the need of your spirit, that can sustain your spirit, is the place from which your spirit was sourced. So, the same way that your body depends on the ground, your spirit depends on God. And prayer is the native language of the spirit, by which the spirit is able to enter into its native source and to be able to draw nourishment and sustenance. Listen to me, people of God. The thing that food does to your natural body, all right, should give you a picture of what prayer does to your spiritual body. And it is possible for you to feed your body fat and to neglect your spirit until your spirit is lean and your spirit basically goes into comatose, even if you are a believer. And there are many Christians that are in that place. They are the give me, help me, pray for me, bless me, send me, you know, me, 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 Christians that are looking for who is the next happening guy in town. They say, ah, that my own prayer, they walk well, well, they are there. They say, ah, there's another prophetess now that is in town. Her own prayer, hey, they are there. I'd like for you to know that if they are true, Indeed, if they are true indeed, whatever it is that is their possibility and their capability, it is sourced from a world where you also have access into. By that I mean that you also are allowed to come to the same place that they used to go, where they used to get the energy and the stature by which they help people. There's an open invitation for you. To also come to that place. And when you begin to attend to the need and you begin to attend to the call to pray, you will find out that there are possibilities in that world that you may never have been exposed to yet 
are possibilities that are ordained for your spirit to exercise. And listen to the people of God. The Bible says that deep calls unto deep. It, it, it is flesh that calls to flesh. It is spirit that calls to the spirit. Physical calls to physical. The invisible calls to the invisible. Whatever you can do physically here with food, however creative you can be, it, it is not going to go deep enough to touch your spirit. And it, it, is, it is even better for you to be poor physically and to be rich in the spirit because in due time, the spirit being superior to the natural, you will see that it will not be long. Your possibilities in the spirit, they will begin to affect your realities in the natural. But if you give only attendance and attention to your physical body, to your natural uh, uh, circumstances, to your natural component, at the expense of your spirit, you would realize that you will continue to perpetually leak out even the things that you seem to have been able to lay hold upon. Why? Because that which is from above is above all. And if at the realm of actual reality, you are not making gains, you are not scoring a mileage, you will soon notice that what is happening to you in the spirit will soon define your life elsewhere. What is happening to you in the spirit will soon define your life everywhere else. Not just elsewhere, everywhere else. Because, uh, as you obviously would have heard over and over again, it is a spiritual that controls the physical, isn't it? You've heard that over and over again. Now, if it is true, why do many of us give more attention to the physical than we give to the spiritual? Because we believe in saying that it's the spiritual that controls the physical. But we are more alive and alert and responsive to the physical than we are to the spiritual. In fact, in, as far as the spiritual is, is, spiritual is concerned, it is just uh, is activity oriented. Many people don't used to remember prayer, maybe except once in a day, when they wake up in the morning or when they want to go to bed at night. Or something happens to them in the course of the day that was totally unexpected. Hey, Jesus, please, Father, please. And then once the episode passes, they, they, they drop back to their default. And their default is carnality. To a bound. To be able to interface with the realm of reality. Meanwhile, the Bible says, Blessed be God, Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. If you have an allocation, and that allocation has been willed to you by the gracious disposition of our merciful God, yet your spiritual allocation, the Bible says, is blessed us with all spiritual blessings. They are in heavenly places. They are in Christ Jesus. And I can tell you that you will never be able to construct a ladder that is long enough by which you can climb into heavenly places. You will never be able to come up with a spacecraft, all right, that is fast and swift and dexterous enough that can move you into heavenly places. Because like I said to you before, the physical senses, your five natural senses, they are only suitable for exploration within nature. Heavenly places in supernature and the tools by which we explore nature cannot penetrate the membrane that separates nature from the supernature. The supernature is what we call supernatural. And in order for you to get into the supernatural realm, you are going to need a different set of tools, a different set of a component in order to investigate that world. And this is the blessed privilege of prayer that while I am walking down the road and it is a physical action as I'm going and I'm touching the ground, I'm stepping on the ground with my two feet at the same time, because man is created to be that kind of being. I can be physically present here and I can be spiritually present in another world. I can be seeing the realities that go on in this place and at the same time I am in touch with the realm of divine and spiritual reality. As I walk down the road and all I need to do many times is just simply a switch in my heart and as I open my mouth and become the 
had opened a schedule and in a moment, in a moment, without a ladder, without an aircraft, without air time, there is no taxation on this matter. You don't need credit in order to be able to make this journey. All it takes, the Lord is spirit and they that worship must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the distance between the physical and the spiritual is not a geographical distance. It is a dimensional distance. Are you with me? It's a dimensional distance. So I don't need to travel to Jerusalem. I don't need to climb a mountain. It is not on this mountain and it's not in Jerusalem. For God is spirit. I love reality for maybe a few seconds. He is in that place this morning. Are you praying the Holy Ghost for a few seconds? Afia to me la mahane. Res kofelina katuma barane. I'm trying to say to you that that is the world for which your spirit was designed. That is the place that your spirit calls home. Is the place that your spirit calls home. Prayer brings us into the immediacy of the world for which our prayer was designed, for which our spirit was designed. Prayer, prayer, prayer brings us into the immediacy of the world for which our spirit was designed. The world from which our spirit was sourced and the world to which our spirit responds.
I will seek you in the morning. I will learn to walk in your ways. Step by step, you will lead me. I will follow you all of my day. For your loving kindness is better than life. Thank <laughs> you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. And so when it was the hour of prayer, Peter and John were heading into the temple. They were heading into the temple to pray. And the Bible says, while they were yet on their way to the temple, there was a certain man, a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, that was carried, whom they laid daily, daily, at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. And they placed him there to ask for arms, to ask for the generosity of God's people. As far as the range of interventions was concerned, healing was not part of it. If there was anything this man was looking forward to, healing was not in the number. He had come to terms with his situation as inevitable, unchangeable, permanent, irreversible. The only thing that he looked forward to doing was how to make the best of a bad situation. And so, this man had resigned to a life of begging. And you see, in our day and time, in this part of the world, there's no shortage of these kinds of people. This man was not looking forward to be healed. He had come to terms with the fact that this is my lot, this is my situation. But I need you to notice something because I will soon be done and out of your way. A certain man was a, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried. I want you to understand that the Bible does not traffic in idle words, scriptures, does not traffic in idle words. That means whatever is written in the Bible is written in the Bible because it's important for our learning. They didn't just say a certain lame man was carried. They said a certain man lame from his mother's womb. We're not just told of his problem. We're told of the circumstances of his problem. We're told of the history of his problem. We're given an insight into the origins of his problem. Many times it will present to us. I can't remember. Where was I? Just say, not too long ago. I was, oh yeah, it was in just actually. All right. Someone had come to see me and we were dealing with something. So he was dealing with something. And while he spoke, he was... The Spirit of the Lord said to me that what he's saying is the problem is not the problem. That's not the problem. The thing that is happening with him now is not the problem. He, he, and the picture was, it's like a dam. A dam is a human structure that is designed to contain the flow of water. When you dam a river, it means that you have impeded, you have interrupted the normal flow of the water in that river. And people dam rivers so that they can use the water for something else at their own level. So it's like water wants to flow, that you build a big, you build a big wall. When the water hits it, then the water cannot continue to flow. So you are able to trap water. But this water wants to make progress, but there's a wall that is preventing it. Any day that you come to the other side, because there are some of you under the sound of my voice that it's like you see, it's like what was happening with that brother. Satan was waiting. In his own case, it was a liability from his father's side. As he was speaking, where it is, as he was speaking, I was seeing something very different. It was a liability that was carried on from his father's side, and because he had become a believer, that liability was no longer able to find expression in his own life until he broke the dam. And he broke that dam because of his huge service. 
when you were, when you were in service. That was when you broke the dam. And as soon as you broke the dam, you could no longer contain what was coming inside. But it is this thing coming inside now that he was coming to me to complain about, that he needs help. One he was talking. Like, no, the thing you have to believe is not your problem. This is simply the symptom of the problem. By an act of the exercise of your will, you intentionally give the enemy the right to come inside. And now that he's here, you are now trying to determine what he can do and what he cannot do. It doesn't work that way. So sometimes, the thing that you are crying about might be the symptom of the thing you should have been crying about. Are you with me? The thing you are crying about might be the symptom of the thing you truly should have been crying about. That means that the thing you are crying about might simply be symptomatic. Sometimes people say, I'm having a headache. Most doctors, doctors will normally tell you that there's really nothing like headache. Generally speaking, a headache is always a symptom of something else. And so you can take pain reliever, but it does not cure the typhoid pathogen that is eating you up. And if you keep managing the symptom, your internal organs might be gone before you realize it. Because the headache is simply a symptom of something else. So if you just keep taking, you know, uh, pain relievers, uh, Parastamols and profane and all the other things that people take to manage pain. You might be managing the pain, but you have left the problem untouched. Jesus saw a man that was lame. No, this man was not lame. This man was paralyzed. He was paralyzed. He couldn't walk, he couldn't sit, he couldn't do anything. That man was permanently on the bed. In order to bring him to Jesus, they could not even back him. They had to bring the man with his bed. And by the time they were eventually able to get the man into the immediate presence of Jesus, Jesus looked at them and he looked at the man. And Jesus did not immediately see what everybody saw as the man's problem. Jesus looked at the man and said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And I'm like, okay. You see, if I was one of the four people that brought that man there, that day, I would have been very, very disappointed, even if not offended. I would have been disappointed. Because those guys didn't bring that man because he was a sinner. You think it was sin that was the reason why they went through all that trouble? They carried that man on the bed. And right now, they have been killed. Huh? They have been killed basically. On top of this man, because in order to get this man to Jesus, they broke somebody's roof. Do you think that they wrote application to break your roof? The man whose roof they broke was not aware that he had lost his roof until he saw this person coming. Because that man was also sitting where Jesus was teaching. So suddenly they saw open heaven. I can imagine what the man in the presence of Jesus is still trying to behave himself. But these four guys. They knew that whatever it is we settle it afterwards. Let's let let let's heal this man first. Ah, we whatever it is we deal with it afterwards. Imagine that they went to all of that. Then Jesus sees the man and now say your sins are forgiven. If you were the one, in fact, in the first place, how much sin can a paralyzed man commit? This man even food. This man cannot eat on. It's what you put in his mouth that he can eat. You can't accuse this man of a decent dress. This man cannot. He can't even take himself to. How much sin can a paralyzed man commit? Yet, when Jesus saw the man, the sin was so big, was so loud, that the sickness was not sin. Jesus didn't see the man's sickness. He saw the man sin. It was after they removed the sin that, oh, okay. Ah. He also paralyzed. What everybody saw was paralysis. That was the loudest thing in the sight of everybody else. The loudest thing in the sight of Jesus was not paralysis, it was sin. So Jesus had to deal with the sin in order to get to where to deal with the paralysis. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. 
And so sometimes, you might be crying after one thing, for one thing, and if you are attentive to hear God, God might be showing you quite, quite a pathway that may be a little bit different from what you had anticipated. There were times when you were calling for something, and God was bringing to your attention the person that you have held in bitterness and unforgiveness. But you are saying, but that's not the matter for now. Right now, Jesus, I'm the hand of the Lord is not too short to save. Huh? His ears are not so dull that he cannot hear. Says Isaiah. He says, But your sin has separated between you and your God, and your iniquity has hidden his face so that he will not hear. The hand of the Lord is not too short to save. But sin can erect the wall between the man and his sin. So that. <laughs> oh, God cannot see you. Sin. Your sin has separated between you and your God. So the, the position of scripture is that whosoever covers his sin shall not, not might not, not may not, shall not prosper. Whoso covers his sin shall not prosper. But whosoever confesses and forsakes shall obtain mercy. So I had to walk that guy back and then he now said, Well, it's true. And then he began to explain what happened in the service and the situation in the family, in the father's side. God had done many things because he had become a believer. God did a number of things in order to safeguard him from the liabilities of his uh, paternal ancestry. A lot. Specific things that God did, including the fact that God encountered him early in life. That's one of the verses that many of you have, and I hope that you appreciate it. You do not know how much of a privilege it is to know God, to have privileges to, to encounter God early in life, especially if you are of African descent. And among those of us that are African, if you cannot count three, four, five generations behind you that walk with the Lord, is even, you are even the most privileged if you now know God early in life. Assuming you knew God before you got married. Ah! What a privilege. If you should be singing. Because the complications that will arise from knowing God late in life. If you come from a lot of the kind of backgrounds that many of us come from, eh? you, you, you will barely have time to, to fight half of the battles of your life. You, there will be many liabilities that you pass on to your children. Meanwhile, a good man give an inheritance to his children's children, not liabilities. So when I see the way that some of you young people are joking with your life, I, you know, just a young lady who just kill you, just mascara and foundation. That's a young man. You are just like me to mercy. I will not young man. They are sitting in one place in Katun or whatever the point I are saying. We will sell that guy next year. You are, you, you are selling it. <laughs> we will sell the father and go to Wisaki after this season. You are who? <laughs> Much that you are watching in viewing center. <laughs> Investigate you. If, if 
they are playing a football match. There are moments where the two people on the pitch per time. Eleven on either side. Two keepers and twenty players. You know the name of everybody on the pitch. Huh? You know where everybody comes from. You know how much they, they were sold. You know what they earn every week. Huh? Hey, see, you are. Hello. Hello. I don't know if you know that game, that draft. There's something they should play. That is called draft. You know draft. Huh? Or you know Ludo. You know Ludo. That's why you have to play with your destiny. <laughs> you, are just, you are just playing Ludo with your destiny. I'd like for you to know that if you are, I used to tell you that if you don't live like Solomon, hmm? like David, don't live like a Solomon. David was a warrior by necessity. There was nothing that I've done about it. He was a warrior by necessity. You know, Solomon didn't fight one war. So Solomon can be telling you that all this warfare, warfare, but what are you talking about? What is what is what is war? It's faith. It does you could just don't believe the finished works of Christ. <laughs> That's why I'm talking about war. Ah, or if you are different, don't believe that something. The only reason why Solomon was not fighting is not because war is not real. It's because somebody already fought him on it. David fought so much that God said, Give me how much war you have fought and the blood on your hand. You can't build my temple. That man fought so much that his physical body took such a toll. At the age of 70, 70, if you heard the story of David, you would have thought that it was like 140. At 70, the Bible said he was old and streaking, streaking. The language is graphic, streaking in years. So he laid down, he was shivering. At 70, 70, they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. He was only 70. That was the period, the age at which Moses started ministry. But you see, that guy had been fighting. From since he was a teenager, a little teenager, that fought all his life. The territorial boundary, the territorial uh, scope of the nation of Israel till today was the largest during the reign of David. If you are looking at kilometer or the square meter of the land. That used to be called Israel. It, it became the largest under David. Till today, David was a warrior conqueror by excellence. So by the time the, the sun was coming king, all the kings around, and David had already talked them a few things. Everybody does naturally came to pay obeisance. In fact, when you read your scripture, you realize that there was really never a need. Solomon didn't travel once out of his room. Everybody else came from everywhere else to come and see him. So David said, I have been young and now I'm old. I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Hello? He means I have not seen the righteous begging bread. So that I've not seen him forsaken, and I've not seen his seed begging bread. Because uh, sometimes things can be hard for the righteous. Even the righteous will beg bread. But you see, when he has gone that route, he sees. Ah! No, he sees. He sees. He cannot beg bread. What the righteous will know. Is a sustaining faithfulness of God. He need not be forsaken. 
you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. He will not be forsaken. But his seed will not beg bread. Because you know, you know how you know how David married Abigail. Abigail was the wife of Nabal. Nabal was one big agriculturist like that, that was into animal husband. And David came to Nabal's house to beg. See, uh, that time when your guys were in the field, were with them one we took very good care of them. Because if you wanted, we would have done something to them. But we didn't. And they're taking care of your flock. We're very good to them. And now that we hear that uh, you are sharing your sheep, we are throwing the party. How far? Find us something to do it. And now I said, oh, these people that break away from their masters these days, why should I come and give you my own discipline? Then they will say, aye, but who so to me, I'm not here tomorrow. So he went with his men and they were going to level Nabal and everything. It was the wisdom of Abigail that saved the day. It was Abigail that ran to intervene and brought food. It was not just mouth bed in the and to eat. Abigail brought food because they really needed it. They brought food and then she pleaded with them. That's how they made refrain from shedding blood. And then about 10 days later, when the man died, when the man died, they be sent proposal to Abigail. All right. David, David begged. He went to look for food at the hands of Nabal. But imagine Solomon. Never in him. Even the temple that Solomon, David was one that arranged for everything that was needed to build it. The kings of Tyre that needed to enter into an agreement. David was one that did all the bilateral agreement and signed the papers and all of that. It was just a court, he, he cannot be called that you were the one that built it. Because of blood in your eyes. If you are a young person, you are a second generation Christian, you are a first generation Christian, you are a third generation Christian, please, don't, don't, don't play what with your life. Don't use your life to play Niger Bet. By the way, if you under the sound of my voice and you do betting, you are wrong. Yeah. You are wrong. You are what? You are wrong. When you live there, you cannot go and ask God. And that man says, I am wrong. Is he correct? That's if you have any relationship at all with him. Go and ask him. You don't have the sound of my voice and you bet. My dad bet. I don't know what the things that is called. The thing is, you become an epidemic. I'm not just saying that it's not ideal. I'm saying you are wrong. You are wrong. It's gambling. It's just that this is, you don't like to. Everybody in church is looking for prayer to run. They put pastors under pressure. So they don't like it. You know, we never have the time to start telling the truth too much that you may not come back again. But you see, in my place, they say, if the eye will break, let it break. Let it stop swelling. Just break at once. Let's know that there's no eye. So if you want to stay, let's be a stay for all the right reasons. Is that okay? A Christian should not come to It's as simple as that. Niger bed is coming. There's no material that they are, there's nothing that they are selling with your money. So the exchange of goods and services. So just in case somebody is there, say, what was stop? Stop, stop market is not, because I've heard people make this silly analogy. I said they should not do betting, but people used to invest in shares. How is that anywhere close to gambling? If you buy shares in that booty, the shares is supposed to go into a company that is trading in sugar, in salt, in spaghetti. Apples. The proceeds, the profit, is now what you shared with the shareholders. And if there are losses, you also pay it, which is normal in business. 
But when you are playing Niger bet, what are they trading with your money? What services or goods have you provided with your money? And not Niger bet or something, just one of the many betting, I don't know, or the other one. So, Niger bet, you are very popular, that's what I'm using. It's not different from that. Those things that back in the in the olden days they used to call it pool. Huh? And we used to say it's only fools that play pool. Don't use your life to play the jacket, whether physically or spiritually. Are you with me? Just say yes, say amen. amen. The man I'm dealing with in Acts chapter 3, how I got into this, is that the Bible says there was a certain man lay from his, was because of the womb from which he came. Hypothetically speaking, it means that if this woman had come from another womb, if this man, sorry, had come out of another womb, maybe the legs would have been normal. Because his lameness began from where? The womb. And I need you to know that nobody's life begins in the womb. God told Jeremiah that before I formed you, I knew you. Hello? <laughs> Isn't it? And before you were in your mother's womb, I ordained you. That means that my history with you predate the womb of your mama. It was just that in order to finally get you to the world, I needed to send you through a pathway. And that pathway included the womb of your mom. So the you that God sent might not be the you that arrived, depending on the womb to which you came. Is this simple enough or is it already starting to be complex? Huh? Is this simple enough? Hello? The womb is not the point of the origin of your existence. God knew before you were formed, formed, before you had shape. God knew before your mother's womb. And even ordained you before, before the language of before means before. But this man's problem, according to scripture, when did it happen in the mother's womb? It was in the womb of his mom that something happened to him. Medical languages, all these kinds of things, congenital conditions. Congenital diseases. Many times people don't even know what causes them. They just you know doctors will always find the name. Glory to God. Uh, by the way, the brother that drove me here is a doctor, so he's laughing. Uh, that's Dr. Sifri, was the one that drove me here from just. So he's, he's, he's. I have a few of them around that. They are, they are, I, I'm not, don't get me wrong, they are of help. Those that are good, they can be of help. I'm just saying that the doctor must have a name for something. You can't come and talk to us, ah, no, we don't do that kind of thing. They will find the name and give it. <laughs> it just is a congenital condition. It just simply means that it's a condition that it does like something befell in the womb of your mom. It's as simple as that. But we know from scripture that your life did not begin in the womb. So you know that sometimes when somebody is pregnant and they were not aware that they were pregnant, there were certain medications that they might have taken. Hello? And then the moment they realize they are pregnant, hey, they start praying, you know, then doctors will advise them that you can't take that thing anymore because they will can bring impact to bear upon the futures upon that baby that is growing there. There are things that can happen to people in the room. Just 
Do you understand that? Okay, so now we can close this meeting. I mean, I can finish this thing in a few minutes. I want you to understand that the only the reason I was doing all of this is not because I'm here to teach you biology or <laughs> organicology. No, that's not I'm here. It's not, we're not running at an attack clinic. I'm, I'm saying all of these things to let you know that there are wounds. There are wounds. There are wounds. The same way you have biological wounds, there are racial wounds, there are ethnic wounds, there are all kinds of wounds, there are gender wounds. That the place from which you came can bring limiting impact upon your life. You know, you know these days they say, hey, so you know people, Nigeria has such a bad name out there. I mean, travel out of the country in some places. The moment you say you are Nigerian, everybody is on the edge. It's almost as if you are guilty until proven innocent. Not innocent until proven guilty. And the only reason for that is because you say you are Nigeria. That's a kind of rule that Nigeria is in many, many, many instances out there. So it looks like if you came out of Nigeria, there are certain things that people naturally impose on you as far as their expectation and orientation of your life is concerned. If, if somebody else came with you and they said, ah, I, where are you from? And the person says that they are from Kenya, they will not give them the same kind of look that they will give you, even though both of you are black for many years, for this man is for more than four decades. The Bible says this man was more than 40 years. This miracle was performed more than 40 years. He suffered the impact of the womb out of which he came for 40 plus years of his life. I don't have the time to go into all of the issues. But, when Peter and John met this man, the man was looking at them, steadfastly expecting that they may get arms, get some money from them. I want you to understand that Peter and John were going into the temple at the hour of prayer. Hmm. When you saw Peter and John, give me verse 2. And a certain man lived from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask arms of them that entered into the temple. He was to ask arms of people that were going into the temple. When people are coming out of the temple, he does have business with them. When they are going into the temple, he has business with them. And it's a very curious and actually sad reality. How can people be useful to him on their way to the temple? before they go into the temple to meet with God in quote, than after they have met with God in the temple. He was, he was, he, he, the only thing he was hoping to get, he was hoping to get it from people on their way into the temple, not from people on their way out of the temple. So what was the impact, what was the importance of whatever it was that people were going inside the temple to go and Including even money. This man hoped to get money from people before they enter the temple. <laughs> but once they go in there, hey, huh? is either they would have collected all the money, or the things they would have put in the temple by the time you are coming outside, there will be no motivation. So, both physically and spiritually, you will now become useless to the man once you have been in the temple. So, his chance was to catch you before they catch you. Hello. Hello. Let's even assume that when you go inside the temple, they will sweet talk you, sweet mouth you, and collect your money. And this is they collect your money. Let, let it be that you also collected something, isn't it? At least that would have been fair, right? Paul said, if you have uh, benefited of spiritual things, then it is not the same if I also benefit of your carnal things. So, at least, let it would have been good if the people coming from out of the temple say, ah, the money we have, we will be giving it there. But, such as we have, there was something we collected from there in the name of Jesus. 
never worked, never happened. That's why I said to you that as an apostolic community, there are there, there, there are there are practices that must mark an apostolic community, that differentiates an apostolic community from every other kind of community. On the side of Peter and John, the miracle is means I don't have silver and I don't have gold. I don't know why I have to say it. If it's me, I will not. Uh, I will, I will just be silent about what I don't have. Hello. So I say, I have something to give you. I would have said, I know what you are looking for. But I have something even more important than what you are looking for. You know? So whether I have what you are looking for or not, will not come into the question. How can man of God just say silver and gold? Have I not? With his full chest. <laughs> don't have silver, don't have gold. And you are a pastor of a 3,000 plus member church. You know Peter? At this time, it was in chapter 2 that Peter preached. 3,000 people had repented and joined the community. And he was the leader of that apostolic community. The membership of Peter's church was 3,000 plus. At least 3,120 people were in that church. So the people he was pastoring at that level would be at least 3,119 people. It was the 120th person. How can you be a pastor of such a church and say silver and gold have I none? Ah uh ah. -uh. What are you doing with the grace of your head? <laughs> they are silver and gold. When they are landowners in your church. They are owners of property. They are church. Big men were in that assembly. I hope you know. Oh, people that had lands, houses, were in that church. You know, that's how they were sustaining themselves for a while. They were able to, this person would go and sell and bring the money. That was what caused the problem in chapter 6 when the Christian Jews were now complaining and murmuring against the Hebrews. It was because of eh? it was because of the pepper that was coming from the different members of the church. Peter was the pastor of that church. Hello. Hello. Peter now said with the others in chapter 6, let us find faithful men, you know, of men of honest who are full of the Holy Ghost, that we will put Wherefore, brethren, look here among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Uh -uh. And you know the thing that Peter wanted to focus on. But we, we give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Oh boy. We can't do ministry like this again today. Today, anyhow, anyhow, we'll combine them. Hello? We'll combine them. Ah. Imagine me the Jew of the ministry and I am one of the signatories. Just find people of honest and powerful of the Holy Ghost. We'll put them over this business. Then we will face prayer and the word. Ah. Is it not my anointing that is producing? And this even if I'm not the accountant, let me see what is going on. And I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just telling you the historical situation. And I'm telling you Peter's model. Are you with me? Hello. Okay, people don't like my sound this morning. That's the problem with church. We like what we like. We don't like what we don't like. Even when what we don't like is in the Bible, we just don't like it. We don't like it. This is why sometimes it looks as if God is far. If you are selecting with God, God will be selecting with you. So when you pray one kind of prayer that God also doesn't like, you be on your own. Say, but I'm kind. Say, I don't like that kind of prayer. <laughs> Peter said, silver and gold have I known. I want you to know that it wasn't always like that for Peter. 
Because eventually people were coming to drop things at the feet of the apostle. Hello. But well, there was a point in the life of this Jew that he didn't have silver and that he did not have gold. But you see, the whole point of saying that is that God. As long as you have a stomach and an appetite, you can fast. And as long as you have a mouth, you can pray. Are you with me? And he says that they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeared before God. There is no excuse for weakness in this house. There isn't. Because it's an all commerce game. Whosoever will, let him come. If you left from this place and say, well, I'm still waiting to heat, I'm still waiting to blow. But while I'm waiting to blow, there's something that cannot wait. Huh? Hey, there's something that cannot wait. The, the Bible says pray without ceasing. There is no good time to pray. There's no bad time to pray. Every time is a good time to pray. And the Bible says the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon his name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The same Lord over all. In Romans chapter 10, verse 12. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call. The richness of God is to all that call. God is over all, right? The same Lord over all is the same Lord is over all of us. But he is only rich to all that call. He's not rich unto all. He's only rich to all that call. So if you will know the riches of God, if you are going to know the largesse of grace, you have to cut yourself out of the general all and join another group that is called all that call. For he shall call upon me and I will answer. He said, call unto me and I will answer and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Let your work appear unto your servants and your glory unto their children. That's the prayer of the saints. Let your work appear unto your servant. Let your work appear unto your servant. Let your work appear unto your servant. You don't need to have an Android phone. You don't need to have an iPhone. Let your work appear unto your servant. You don't need to have data. Let your work appear unto your servant. There's no network congestion. Let your work appear to your servant under the sun. You will connect. Let your work appear to your servant in the rain. We see here, there's no network issue there. I can understand if you are poor. I can understand if you are graceless. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, they such as I have. They such as I have. Uh -uh. Even in Nigeria, I don't think you say that at all, at all, I'm bad. At all, at all. See, I don't have, and I don't have at all, at all. Now that one, bad. I don't have money. But I have something. And what this man has, hey, in the in back in the day we used to sing something more than gold, something more than gold. The spirit of the Lord in the heart of man is something more than gold. He didn't have silver, he didn't have gold, he has something infinitely more precious than silver and gold. So much as I have. Give I unto you. What was it that he had? In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, he said, Rise up and walk. That was what he had. It was a name. That's what he had. And I'm saying that this man did this. These men did this on their way to prayer. They have not even prayed. Huh? They have not even prayed. This was not Peter and John coming from prayer. This is going to pray. So imagine what these men would have been capable of doing after praying. This is their normal default mode. This is Peter and John on charge. They never charge yet. Rescue. If the man charged, these were the men 
that they said, these were the kinds of men that they said they used to turn the world upside down. This was. In chapter 5, they said, you people have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and we intend to bring the blood of this man upon us. These were the men. Their secret, prayer, doctrine, fellowship, and the breaking of bread. That was the signature of that apostolic community. No wonder they were such a powerful people. This morning, even if I have silver and gold, I won't give you. But such as I have, such as I have from the Lord, I give you this money. There's anyone under the sound of my voice that is looking for something that is intangible in the heaven. I, 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 I came here today with intangibles, intangibles, intangibles. I, I came here to traffic in matter, in capital, with resources that are supernatural in nature. And if you can lay hold on it, it will, it will bring the tangibility to you. Because like we used to say, the spiritual controls the physical. If you resolve it there, it's only a matter of time. It will crystallize here. It will crystallize here. Silver and gold, have I not? Two prayers we pray. You will pray one and we pray the other. Every, every room, every room that is crippled you. We are talking about next level. Next level is not give me, give me. It's not, no. You cannot be a beggar after this weekend. You can't. There are all kinds of coping mechanisms that we have come up with in order to accommodate our maladies. To this, this morning, God will go to the root of the malady so that the coping mechanism will become unnecessary. You see, after this day, this man no longer needed to sit by that gate to ask for arms. His own feet could not take him to the farm, and his own hands were now going to be able to provide for his necessities so much that he also now can become a philanthropic. So we will deal with we send God back to where it is that we are coming from. Huh? Some, some of your limitation is your sex. It's because you are a woman. Answer ah, them. Everybody, so even woman won't put him out into this matter. What, what, whatever the root of the issue is, whatever the root that is trying to cripple you is, there is a protocol in the spirit. You know, override. There's a protocol in the spirit by which you can override the womb. The impact of the womb can be over, overridden. And that's the prayer you will pray. And because it is a prayer that you will pray, I have no control over it. If you pray, it's fine. If you don't pray, it, no problem. If you want to be serious, go. If you don't want to be serious, keep praying, you don't. Huh? Okay, one. Ah, I beat you, I beat you. No problem. If, if it's draft, you want to do it. You know how the Bible says, say he that is righteous, let him be righteous too. Yeah. And anyone, no problem. There is a day that will break. As the songwriter says, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, when the eternal morning shall break bright and fair, when the saints of God shall gather over on the other side, there is a day, there is such a day. The other one said, in the sweet by and by, in the sweet by and by, we shall meet at that beautiful shore. But I tell you, when we arrive there, we will not all be at the same kingdom. And what we do with time will determine our estate in eternity. This is your moment, this is your moment. So cripple the things that cripple you. You are looking for next level, no problem. The thing that has kept you perpetually at this level, you want to, you want to stretch out in faith and latch on to grace and touch the impact of every woman. The anything that you could not have changed must not be a disadvantage. I did not decide to be a Nigerian. Being a Nigerian, therefore, cannot be a disadvantage. I did not apply to be male. Being male, therefore, cannot be.
be a disadvantage. I do not apply to be gala. Being a gala cannot be a disadvantage. I do not apply to be black. Being a black man cannot be a disadvantage. Not being that I must be a disadvantage anymore. We override the voice of the womb. We override the voice of the womb. We override the voice of the womb. And not the reason why my father and my mother were divorced. They say I'm an illegitimate child. What, what, what did I contribute to it? We silence the womb. You have two minutes to pray. We silence the voice of the womb.
seconds. Because I see that some of us are not there yet. Some of us are not there yet. Receive strength in your bones. Receive strength. 
strength in your soul. Receive strength in your mind. Receive strength in your business. The Lord blesses the work of your hands. Your coming out is blessed. Your coming in is blessed. Your bread is blessed. Your water is blessed. Your basket is blessed. Be gone in the name of Jesus. Amen. 